Chapter One of Book Twelve of Les Miserables, Volume Four by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Les Miserables, Volume Four by Victor Hugo, translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book Twelve, Corinth. Chapter One. HISTORY OF CORINTH FROM ITS FOUNDATION The Parisians who nowadays, on entering on the Rue Rambuteau at the end near the Halle, notice on their right, opposite the Rue Mondetour, a basket-maker's shop having for its sign a basket in the form of Napoleon the Great, with this inscription, Napoleon is made holy of willow have no suspicion of the terrible scenes which this very spot witnessed hardly thirty years ago. It was there that lay the Rue de la Chanverie, which ancient deeds spell Chanverrerie, and the celebrated public-house called Corinth. The reader will remember all that has been said about the barricade effected at this point, and eclipsed, by the way, by the barricade Saint-Marie, it was on this famous barricade of the Rue de la Chanverie, now fallen into profound obscurity, that we are about to shed a little light. May we be permitted to recur, for the sake of clearness in the recital, to the simple means which we have already employed in the case of Waterloo. Persons who wish to picture to themselves in a tolerably exact manner the constitution of the houses which stood at that epoch near the Pont saint Eustache at the northeast angle of the Halle of Paris, where today lies the embouchure of the Rue Rambuteau, have only to imagine an N touching the Rue Saint-Denis with its summit and the Halle with its base, and whose two vertical bars should form the Rue de la Grande Truanderie and the Rue de la Chanverie, and whose transverse bars should be formed by the Rue de la Petite Truanderie. The old Rue Mondetour cut the three strokes of the N at the most crooked angles, so that the labyrinth confusion of these four streets sufficed to form, on a space three fathoms square, between the Halle and the Rue Saint-Denis on the one hand, and between the Rue des Signy and the Rue des Prechures on the other, seven islands of houses, oddly cut up, of varying sizes, placed crosswise and haphazard, and barely separated, like the blocks of stone in a dock, by narrow crannies. We say narrow crannies, and we can give no more just idea of those dark, contracted, many-angled alleys lined with eight-story buildings. These buildings were so decrepit that, in the Rue de la Chanverie and the Rue de la Petite Truanderie, the fronts were shored up with beams running from one house to another, the street was narrow and the gutter broad the pedestrian there walked on a pavement that was always wet skirting little stalls resembling cellars big posts encircled with iron hoops excessive heaps of refuse and gates armed with enormous century-old gratings the rue rambuteau has devastated all that the name of mondetour paints marvelously well the sinuosities of that whole set of streets. A little further on they are found still better expressed by the Rue Pirouette, which ran into the Rue Mondetour. The passer-by who got entangled from the Rue Saint-Denis in the Rue de la Chanverie beheld it gradually close in before him, as though he had entered an elongated funnel. At the end of this street, which was very short, he found further passage barred in the direction of the Halle by a tall row of houses, and he would have thought himself in a blind alley had he not perceived on the right and left two dark cuts through which he could make his escape. This was the Rue Mondetour, which on one side ran into the Rue des Prechures, and on the other into the Rue du Signy and the Petite Truanderie. At the bottom of this sort of cul-de-sac, at the angle of the cutting on the right there was to be seen a house which was not so tall as the rest and which formed a sort of cape in the street it is in this house of two stories only that an illustrious wine-shop had been merrily installed three hundred years before 
this tavern created a joyous noise in the very spot which old theophilus described in the following couplet la branle l'esquelle horrible d'un pauvre amant qui se pendit there swings the horrible skeleton of a poor lover who hung himself the situation was good and tavern keepers succeeded each other there from father to son in the time of Mathieu and Regnier, this cabaret was called the Pot de Rose, and as the rebus was then in fashion, it had for its signboard a post, Potio, painted rose collar. In the last century, the worthy Natois, one of the fantastic masters nowadays despised by the stiff school, having got drunk many times in this wine shop, at the very table where Regnier had drunk his fill, had painted by way of gratitude a bunch of corinth grapes on the pink post the keeper of the cabaret in his joy had changed his device and had caused to be placed in gilt letters beneath the bunch these words at the bunch of corinth grapes au raison du corinth hence the name of corinth nothing is more natural to drunken men than ellipses the ellipsis is the zigzag of the phrase Corinth gradually dethroned the Pot de Rose. The last proprietor of the dynasty, Father Hucheloup, no longer acquainted even with the tradition, had the post painted blue. A room on the ground floor, where the bar was situated, one on the first floor containing a billiard table, a wooden spiral staircase piercing the ceiling, wine on the tables, smoke on the walls, candles in broad daylight, this was the style of this cabaret. A staircase with a trap door in the lower room led to the cellar. On the second floor were the lodgings of the Hucheloup family. They were reached by a staircase which was a ladder rather than a staircase, and had for their entrance only a private door in the large room on the first floor. Under the roof, in two mansard attics, were the nests for the servants. The kitchen shared the ground floor with the tap room. Father Hucheloup had, possibly, been born a chemist, but the fact is that he was a cook. People did not confine themselves to drinking alone in his wine shop. They also ate there. Hucheloup had invented a capital thing which could be eaten nowhere but in his house, stuffed carps, which he called carpe au gras. These were eaten by the light of the tallow candle or of a lamp of the time of Louis the Sixteenth on tables to which were nailed waxed cloths in lieu of tablecloths people came thither from a distance hucheloup one fine morning had seen fit to notify passers-by of this speciality he had dipped a brush in a pot of black paint and as he was an orthographer on his own account as well as a cook after his own fashion he had improvised on his wall this remarkable inscription carpe ho grat one winter the rainstorms and the showers had taken a fancy to obliterate the s which terminated the first word and the g which began the third this is what remained carpe ho rat time and rain assisting a humble gastronomical announcement had become a profound piece of advice in this way it came about that though he knew no french father hucheloup understood latin that he had evoked philosophy from his kitchen, and that, desirous simply of effacing Lent, he had equaled Horace. And the striking thing about it was that that also meant, enter my wine shop. Nothing of all this is in existence now. The Mondeteur labyrinth was disemboweled and widely opened in 1847, and probably no longer exists at the present moment. The Rue de la Chanvrerie and Corinth have disappeared beneath the pavement of the rue Rambuteau. As we have already said, Corinth was the meeting place, if not the rallying point, of Corferac and his friends. It was Grantaire who had discovered Corinth. He had entered it on account of the Carpe Horat, and had returned thither on account of the Carpe Gras. There they drank, there they ate, there they shouted. They did not pay much, they paid badly, they did not pay at all, but they were always welcome. 
Father Hucheloup was a jovial host. Hucheloup, that amiable man, as was just said, was a wine shopkeeper with a moustache, an amusing variety. He always had an ill-tempered air, seemed to wish to intimidate his customers, grumbled at the people who entered his establishment, and had rather the mean of seeking a quarrel with them than of serving them with soup. And yet, we insist upon the word, people were always welcome there. This oddity had attracted customers to his shop, and brought him young men who said to each other, Come here, Father Hucheloup, growl. And he had been a fencing master. All of a sudden he would burst out laughing, a big voice, a good fellow. He had a comic foundation under a tragic exterior. He asked nothing better than to frighten you, very much like those snuff boxes which are in the shape of a pistol. The detonation makes one sneeze. Mother Hucheloup, his wife, was a bearded and very homely creature. About 1830, Father Hucheloup died. With him disappeared the secret of stuffed carps. His inconsolable widow continued to keep the wine shop, but the cooking deteriorated and became execrable. The wine, which had always been bad, became fearfully bad. Nevertheless, Courfeyrac and his friends continued to go to Corinth, out of pity, as Bossuet said. The widow Hucheloup was breathless and misshapen, and given to rustic recollections. She deprived them of their flatness by her pronunciation. She had a way of her own of saying things, which spiced her reminiscences of the village and of her springtime. It had formerly been her delight, so she affirmed, to hear the Lou de Gorget chanter dans les ogrepinis, to hear the redbreasts sing in the hawthorn trees. The hall on the first floor, where the restaurant was situated, was a large and long apartment, encumbered with stools, chairs, benches, and tables, and with a crippled, lame, old billiard table. It was reached by a spiral staircase, which terminated in the corner of the room at a square hole like the hatchway of a ship. This room, lighted by a single narrow window, and by a lamp that was always burning, had the air of a garret. All the four-footed furniture comported itself as though it had but three legs. The whitewashed walls had for their only ornament the following quatrain in honor of Mame Hucheloup. Il étonné à dix pas, il épouvanté à dieu. Une verrou habité en son ne hasardu, en tremblé à chaque instant que elle ne vu la mouche, et que un beau jour son ne ne tombe dans sa bouche. She astounds at ten paces, she frightens at two, a wart inhabits her hazardous nose. You tremble every instant lest she should blow it at you, and lest some fine day her nose should tumble into her mouth. This was scrawled in charcoal on the wall. Mame Hucheloup, a good likeness, went and came from morning till night before this quatrain with the most perfect tranquillity. Two serving maids, named Metelot and Gibelot, who had never been known by any other names, helped Mame Hucheloup to set on the tables the jugs of poor wine and the various broths which were served to the hungry patrons in earthenware bowls. Matelote, large and plump, red-haired and noisy, the favorite ex-sultana of the defunct Hucheloup, was homelier than any mythological monster, be it what it may. Still, as it becomes the servant to always keep in the rear of the mistress, she was less homely than Mame Hucheloup. Gibelot, tall, delicate, white, with a lymphatic pallor, with circles round her eyes and drooping lids, always languid and weary, afflicted with what may be called chronic lassitude, the first up in the house and the last in bed, waited on every one, even the other maid, silently and gently, smiling through her fatigue with a vague and sleepy smile. Before entering the restaurant room, the visitor read on the door the following line written there in chalk by Corfarac. Regale si tu pu, 
it manger si tu lo sais treat if you can and eat if you dare end of book twelve chapter one